Hi, welcome back to Botany 101. General Botany, my name is Angela Nishimoto, and I'm your guide for today. All right, we're continuing on photosynthesis. Our objectives today, pigments in plants, what do they do? What are the two phases of photosynthesis? Where do these phases take place? And what happens during these phases? And what is the overall balanced chemical reaction for photosynthesis? Furthermore, another question, what are variations on the Calvin cycle? We're also going to be talking about cellular respiration. So first of all, what is cellular respiration? Okay, we're gonna find that out. Secondly, what is the overall balanced chemical reaction for cellular respiration? Similar to photosynthesis, cellular respiration does have a chemical reaction, a series of chemical reactions. What are the phases of cellular respiration and where do these phases take place? What happens during these phases? Okay. So photosynthesis, what is photosynthesis? Which happens in green plants and in algae and also in blue-green bacteria. And that happens when light energy from the sun, solar energy, is converted into chemical energy. Okay. Recall that from the sun, you have EM radiation, also known as electromagnetic radiation, from very long wavelengths to very short wavelengths, from very low energy to high energy. Okay. So within this electromagnetic spectrum, we have the visible light spectrum because plants absorb light within the visible light spectrum, okay? Recall that we talked about before that light behaves as a particle. You know, it hits in discrete pieces called photons, all right? And yet, it also travels in waves, okay? Making wavelengths, all right? Generally, the longer the wavelength of a wave okay, uh, or of light, the less energy it has. Remember, on one side of the electromagnetic spectrum, you have very long wavelengths, such as radio waves. On the other side, you have very, very high energy, short wavelengths, such as gamma rays, and et cetera, X-rays, yes? So generally, visible light is uh, the spectrum at which plants absorb them. And generally, visible light goes all the way from 380 nanometers to 600, and, uh, I'm sorry, 600, 760 nanometers, so from 380 to 760 nanometers. And remember, nano is a prefix that means billions, so these nanometers are billions of meters. Yeah, very, very small. And generally, this visible light is absorbed by plants, all right? Okay, so if we can kind of um, go to the Elmo, we have here, okay, a plant, all right? And of course, what do you see about it? What do you notice? Yes, it's green for one thing, yes? So this is a plant known as moa, also known as silotum. It is a native Hawaiian plant, okay? And you can see that in this case, this plant doesn't have any leaves. In this plant, it is a stem that does the photosynthesis. But generally, you can tell the stem does photosynthesis because it's green, okay? It's green due, due to the pres presence of certain pigments. And if you look at another plant here, we have, as we've seen before, the same little baby fern, very small fern plant. And on this one, you see that the leaves are photosynthetic, okay? Now, another thing interesting about this fern, it has these, remember what kind of leaves it has? It has, remember, pinnately compound leaves. This whole thing is a single leaf with the blade dissected or uh, arranged in leaflets, all right? So here you have one fern leaf, here you have another, all right? And ferns, okay, their leaves do the photosynthesis because the leaves are green, okay? Generally, any part of a plant that has this pigmentation, any part of the plant that's green does photosynthesis, all right? And how do they absorb these, uh, pig, uh, how do they absorb these wavelengths of light, okay? For one thing, well, how they actually uh, uh, do that is they have the presence of certain pigments, okay? So recall that the leaves are green as well as the stem on the moa, okay? So visible light, you know, for us too, it works also the same way. Light by any object is absorbed or transmitted 
or reflected, or it can be done, you know, in different ways. For one thing, okay, remember that generally the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of longer wavelengths of visible light, you have red at what end. At the other end, higher energy, you have violet with red, then orange, then yellow, then green, then blue, then violet. And then, so all of these lights, all of these light that is actually refracted through a pigment, if you have white light, if all the wavelengths are absorbed, you have the object looking black, okay? So if all the wavelengths, all the way from red to violet, are absorbed by the object, the object looks black to us, all right? Now, conversely, if, you know, all those wavelengths from red all the way to violet are reflected, the object looks white. So you can kind of think of this, you know, in the olden days, uh, how fashion was, generally people tended to wear very dark colors, navy blue, black, during the winter time. And why is that? Because they say black absorbs warmth. It will actually absorb uh, uh, electromagnetic energy. So you can think of it that way. And what do you think of when you think of summertime? You think of people playing tennis, you think of people at the beach, okay? So generally, I guess traditionally, people wore white during summertime because white helps to reflect the light, yeah? So you can kind of remember it that way. So all the wavelengths that are absorbed, that gives you black. If all the wavelengths are reflected, that gives you white, okay? So we have a question here. Leaves generally are green. So what is happening in that situation, okay? So uh, let's see. If we can go to the ELMO, okay, it has to do with the absorption spectra, okay? If we go to the ELMO, we can see that these leaves are green. Why is that? We actually have an absorption, uh, absorptic, uh, absorption spectrum, okay, that generally plants tend to absorb mostly in the red-orange on one side of the spectrum and the blue-violet, okay, because remember you have two kinds of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Each one tends to absorb more on one side. So what happens is that on this leaf, the light that's hitting it is reflecting off of it and going into the uh, uh, camera that's on it, and it's reflecting green, green and yellow. So if the plant absorbs mostly red, orange, and blue, violet, it actually reflects others and also transmits other lights too, okay? So this is one reason why leaves are green. So leaves are green, okay, because due to the fact that they have these pigments in them. And these chlorophyll pigments will actually reflect and also transmit green and also a little bit of yellow. This is, so, so the green and the yellow are areas of the spectrum that the plant does not absorb so much light at. So it absorbs red and orange, okay, and blue and violet, all right? It's kind of interesting, huh? Okay, so pigments. The main pigments in a green plant, okay, include the chlorophyll pig pigments, okay, chlorophylls A and B, and also involves carotenoids. And what are carotenoids? They are responsible for uh, pigment colors such as orange and red, such as some of the carotenes, and also xanthophylls. And these tend to be more yellow and brown pigments. But generally, green plants have all these types of pigments, okay, chlorophylls as well as carotenoids. All right? Generally, you can see the carotenoids in uh, deciduous plants, in temperate areas, when the trees are uh, having their leaves change color as the uh, cold season approaches, then you see the yellows and the reds and the oranges and the browns, because what happens is that the, the leaf is senescing or dying and um, the chlorophyll pigments are fading away. Therefore, the leaves look to us orange and red and brown and yellow because the chlorophyll pigments aren't there anymore, okay? All right, photosynthesis. Okay, the two phases of photosynthesis are called the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. Okay, these are two uh, parts or two phases of the whole process that we know of as photosynthesis. Now the light reactions are what we call the photochemical part of photosynthesis. Okay, that has to do with absorbing light and changing it okay, to chemical energy, taking sunlight energy and converting it into chemical energy. And you remember when we talked about the, um, the th laws of thermodynamics? For one thing, you cannot convert energy from one form to another without losing so-called energy from the system, okay? So what happens during the light reactions? Well, during the light reactions, water is split, okay, because water, of course, is a, a, a reagent that is used to do photosynthesis, so the water molecules are split, and oxygen gas is actually released, okay, because remember, water is H2O. So the O, or the oxygen, making up the water molecule, is released, okay, during the first part of photosynthesis called the light reactions. Another thing that happens is as water is split, 
okay? Electrons come from the water molecule as well as hydrogen ions. Remember, hydrogen ions are um, generally just a proton. Okay, they have a positive charge, yes? So you have protons, you have electrons, and oxygen gas all coming from water, all right? And what happens is that these electrons are then added to a substance known as ADP+, and that forms a substance known as NADPH, okay, nicotinamide adenine diphosphate, okay? All right, so what happens is that it also, that this light reaction also gives energy to make ATP uh, during the process known as electron transport, okay? So we're gonna get into uh, more about the light reaction soon, Okay, but first of all, we can see here from this uh, great image that energy from sunlight, okay, is harvested, okay, by something called photosystems, okay? Just remember that photosystems are just clusters of several hundred chlorophyll and other pigment molecules making up a photosystem. And generally in a chloroplast, this is depicting a chloroplast, you have these stack of, stacks of thylakoid membranes arranged in formations known as grana. Okay, so generally photosystem two is the one that is generally hit first by the photon, the little packet of light, and then uh, eventually it moves to photosystem one, but we'll get into that in a little bit. We also see that here, during the light reactions, H2O, or water, is actually uh, used here. Split by light, oxygen gas given off, okay? Hydrogen ions, as well as electrons. Electrons are carried by NADPH, okay, over from the light reactions to the Calvin cycle. Another thing too is that the hydrogen ions or the H pluses, the protons are used to create ATP in a process known as chemiosmosis. We'll get into that in a little bit, okay? So this ATP, remember ATP uh, um, is a currency of energy in the cell. Okay, so ATP and the electrons from NADPH carried over okay, to the Calvin cycle is actually used to drive the reactions of the Calvin cycle. And it isn't until the Calvin cycle that you see carbon dioxide coming in, okay? Carbon dioxide coming in, and then what eventually, you know, in the Calvin cycle, you get the formation of a three carbon compound known as glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Don't, don't worry about the name so much. The most important things are the concepts, okay? Anyway, so this three carbon compound is joined to another three carbon compound to make glucose. So glucose, which we know of as a monosaccharide, remember monosaccharides are carbohydrates of a single, single, uh, single sugar unit. Okay, so glucose is then used to make end products such as starch or other sugars, okay, or other biological compounds. Okay, so it's like a wonderful amazing, miraculous sort of thing that happens in green plants. You look around yourself, there are plants around you all the time. They're always doing this. It is like a miracle, okay, amazing, okay? So the light reactions, remember that they happen in these stacks of thylakoid membra membranes known as grana, right? And you have these photosystems. Just remember, don't be intimidated, okay? Just remember that these photosystems are just um, clusters of pigment molecules arranged Okay, in a particular photosystem. And you might be thinking, why do you have photosystem two before photosystem one? Well, uh, they named the photosystems according to the order that they discovered them, okay? Pretty much you can think of in photosystem two as being, that's actually the first part, you know, of this um, amazing process. The light hits photosystem two, and then the, uh, the water molecule is split, the electrons are excited, okay, so we're gonna get into that in a second. But photosystem two is what they might call, what you might call, the water splitting photosystem, okay? Photosystem one, you can call as the NADPH generating photosystem, okay? Just remember, light generally hits photosystem two first, okay? So photosystems, they are merely complexes of chlorophylls and carotenoids, pigment molecules. They're just bunches of them all in the membrane, clustered together, okay? So what happens during the light reactions? The photon, remember a photon is just a packet of light. The photon hits a pigment molecule, okay? Then what happens is that the energy in the form of an excited, well, so the energy will actually bounce off one pigment molecule to the next, going to a reaction center chlorophyll. That just means that the reaction center chlorophyll then, okay, will actually get excited. Anyway, so water is split, oxygen gas is released. So the oxygen gas comes from the water, 
okay? Later on, when we look at the um, overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis, you might think, oh, why doesn't, you know, wouldn't you think that the oxygen gas would come from the carbon dioxide? No, that is not the case. The oxygen gas actually comes from the water molecule, okay? What then happens is that the electron that is liberated, right, from the water being split, remember, you have H2O, the hydrogen is actually split, so you have an electron and you have a proton, or also known as a hydrogen ion. Then you have the oxygen gas release, and then anyway, so this electron is excited. It's raised to an excited state, okay? Then, uh, from this excited state, this electron has a lot of energy. Remember, chemicals and other substances, they have energy due to position, okay? Then this electron in the membrane is passed down a series of electron acceptors. Don't have to worry about the names of these different you know, proteins and other substances. Just know that the electron is passed from one electron acceptor to another in something called an electron transport chain. And because it's passed down this electron transport chain, you actually have a slow release of energy, okay, in a way, all right? Now what happens then is that in the light reactions, furthermore, ATP, remember the cell needs ATP in the chloroplast to drive the reactions of the Calvin cycle. So ATP is generated by uh, an enzyme known as ATP synthase. That's located in the membranes, okay, of the thylakoid membranes. Then in the second part that happens, the photon will hit a pigment molecule in photosystem one. Okay, the first time it happened, that happened in photosystem two. The next time it happens, a photon hits a pigment molecule in photosystem one, Okay, the energy goes to the reaction center, the energy just bounces from one pigment molecule to the next, going to a reaction center. The electron is again, that's uh, in, involved, is excited again, and also passed down another electron transport chain. Okay, in this case though, NADPH is generated uh, from NADP plus uh, a, a proton, okay, and also electrons. So NADPH will actually carry electrons, okay, it will actually carry uh, electrons over to the Calvin cycle and also hydrogen ions, okay? All right, so here we see the photosystems, okay? Just see, don't have to worry about P680 or P700. Just know, okay, that this first part here, you have water, okay? What's happening? Sunlight is hitting the water, okay? And what it does is it splits, all right? So this is the part that will actually make oxygen and is also the water splitting photosystem here, okay? So the light, light molecules, so you have uh, water going in, light splitting water, what you end up with is oxygen gas plus protons, okay, plus excited, excitement, okay? You have the fact that you have this photosystem, this electrons raised up to a high energy state. It's, it's what they call excited. Then this electron is passed just from one electron acceptor to the next electron acceptor to the next electron acceptor, etc. okay? And as this electron is actually losing energy, it goes back to a less excited state, what happens is that the, the electron transport chain will provide you know, energy for the synthesis of ATP, okay, from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus a phosphate group. So what you end up with is adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. Okay, what happens next? Another photon, okay, another, uh, a uh, discrete part of, uh, packet of light will hit photosystem one. Okay, what, the same thing happens. You have an excited electron. You, first, you have the energy jumping from one pigment, mo mo pigment molecule to the next. You have an excited electron, and then you have the fact that the, the electron is in pass down the electron transport chain until you actually have NADP plus plus uh, uh, hydrogen ions, and then what you do is you'll have NADPH. So NADPH here, and also ATP, this, these are substances that will go to the Calvin cycle, okay? Please don't be intimidated. It seems very complicated, and, and on some level, it really is complicated. Do you know that they have not been able to do photosynthesis? I think we talked about this before. They have not been able to simulate photos photosynthesis. It is still something that only plants can do. Plants and algae and also blue-green bacteria. These are the only organisms, only things even that can do photosynthesis. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so you're surrounded by plants all the time. And every day they're doing this miracle called photosynthesis, which is of course the source of all the food, all the pretty, pretty much all the oxygen we breathe, uh, a lot of medicines, shelter, clothing. Okay, so photosynthesis, this is the basis of that, okay? So photosynthesis, the next part is called the Calvin cycle. This is the biochemical 
part of photosynthesis, okay? So what happens is that this is the part where carbon dioxide, remember carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? So carbon dioxide, which is a fairly low concentration, I think it's only like 0 0.035% uh, of the atmosphere, like 3.5 hundredths of a percentage of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, okay? So oftentimes carbon dioxide is a limiting factor. Another thing too is in, during the Calvin cycle, you have the fixation of carbon dioxide okay, to form sugars. Remember glucose is C6H12O6, so you have six carbons in glucose. Okay, so what happens is that the sugars are formed using the energy from NA, uh, NADPH and also ATP from the light reactions, okay? So photosynthesis, the Calvin cycle. Look at this, boy. I know you're probably going googly-eyed right now, yeah? But don't, don't be scared, it's okay. What happens is here you see ATP, ATP okay, from the um, light reactions. What's happening is that uh, ATP goes to ADP because what's happening is that it's phosphorylating this sugar here. The little black dots, these are standing for the carbon, so this is a five carbon compound. You just have the transfer of a phosphate group. You have a phosphate with four oxygens around it, okay? Don't, so don't be intimidated. When you actually look at a chemical structure, you know, just kind of try to be detached and don't, don't get really scared, all right? This is just the phosphate group. So this is showing a phosphorylation, a transfer of a phosphate group from ATP to this sugar, this five carbon sugar. Okay, so this is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And don't worry about the name so much, okay? So don't be concerned. The important thing is knowing the concept. So this is bisphosphate because you have two phosphate groups, one on this side, one on this side. Anyway, so here you have carbon dioxide, the carbon with the two oxygens on it, right? Carbon dioxide. What you'll have is you'll have this, this carbon dioxide fastening, you know, uh, um, bonding onto here, all right? So you have this structure here, okay? So what you have is another ATP going in there, uh, ADP, I'm sorry, ADP, then you have the phosphate group, okay, kind of going off. Anyway, just know that in this cycle, generally you have uh, chemical cycle cycling in this circular fashion where the ending molecule that you end up with is used to regenerate and redo the cycle over and over. Okay, so don't be so intimidated. This is mostly to show you that, you know, phosphorylation and also just, just the Calvin cycle is a series of chemical reactions. Pretty much every arrow here, okay, is one reaction happening. So you can see that the Calvin cycle is a whole bunch of reactions happening, each of these reactions being facilitated by enzymes. Remember what enzymes are? Enzymes are protein. It helps to lower the activation energy of a chemical process. So what happens at each of these substances, so we don't even, uh, I think this drawing doesn't show you all the different intermediates, and it doesn't need to. The basic thing is a concept that it's made up of several chemical reactions. Okay, it does use ATP and NADPH, all right? And what you have is you have uh, quite a few chemical reactions, each of which is facilitated by an enzyme. So this is a great illustration because it shows you it with just enough complexity, but not so much. Not too much complexity, I hope, okay? All right. So the Calvin cycle itself happens in the part of the chloroplast known as a stroma, right? So here you have the use of ATP and NADPH, also carbon dioxide added to a five carbon sugar. So here's a diagram of a five carbon sugar, yeah, like that, okay? And furthermore, okay, so this five carbon sugar, you know, you have carbon dioxide added to that. So this is split to form a three carbon phosphoglyceraldehyde. Okay, so here you can see that here, this drawing doesn't show you the carbons, but the carbons are located here and here and here. So this is a three carbon okay, uh, substance. And here you can see the phosphate group. Yeah, just a phosphate with the four oxygens yeah, attached to it. Okay, so chemistry is, well, chemistry is something that you do have to work at to, to get good at it, but it's really worth it because you feel that you can uh, really understand things when they're happening, okay? Anyway, so what happens is that this three carbon compound is then converted to phos phosphoglyceraldehyde. Okay, this is phosphoglyceraldehyde. I think that other one was phosphoglyceric acid, okay? And what happens is this, this conversion requires the NADPH plus protons, okay, as well. And then it also needs ATP, okay? Because ATP is a powerhouse of the cell. It actually is something that will help to fuel chemical reactions, 
all right? So what then happens is you have this 2,3 carbon phosphoglyceraldehyde. What they'll do is that they'll actually interconvert. They'll eventually become a 6-carbon six six compound. And eventually, after chemical reactions, furthermore, then you'll have glucose, okay, or a monosaccharide. Yeah, so generally when we, do, when we talk about photosynthesis, usually we say the ending product is glucose, okay? So then in the cell, this glucose molecule, so here you can see that this is a six carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, and glucose can actually have an open chain formation or a closed chain formation. In solution, it actually goes from one form to the other pretty, pretty um, reasonably okay, okay? So glucose then is actually, if, it, if the plant um, has too much glucose or it doesn't need all the glucose you know, to, to use in its everyday activity, then they'll actually join the glucose units together because remember, you can actually join a whole bunch of glucose units and then form starch. Yeah, starch is a d deposition product of the plant. This is the form that the plant usually stores energy as if it doesn't need it right away. Just like we humans, we unfortunately, especially us women, we tend to store fat, you know? So plants store starch usually. Another thing that glucose can be converted to would be sucrose. Remember, sucrose is a disaccharide. Sucrose is a glucose molecule plus a fru fructose molecule covalently bonded together. And sucrose, furthermore, is known as table sugar. Okay? And there are other kind of organic compounds that glucose can be converted to. The, uh, the plant does not store energy as glucose. It will usually be converted to starch or converted to sucrose or some other compound okay, for other purposes. Okay? Furthermore, going into the overall balanced chemical reaction of photosynthesis, you need to know this. Okay? So here, uh, we can kind of analyze it here. Okay, so if you're not used to seeing chemical formulas, okay, so you recall from our looking at the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, that is pretty complicated, yeah? So this overall balanced chemical reaction, okay, is very much the whole thing that happens. And it's simplified into just a bunch of chemical symbols, okay? So this just means six molecules of carbon dioxide, yeah? So this is six carbon dioxide, okay? plus 12 okay, water molecules. Okay, so you see that water is split, right? So plus sunlight energy. Okay? So eventually in the, in the plant that undergoes you know, these, those two parts, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. Okay? After all of that, which is, you can see, pretty complicated, you end up with one molecule of glucose. Glucose has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygen atoms. Okay, making up glucose, plus six molecules of, car, uh, of oxygen gas. Remember that this oxygen gas actually comes from the water molecule being split here. Yeah? And then what you'll have at the end, too, is six molecules of water as well. Okay? So you might think, you know, why not just have six carbon dioxides and six water molecules? Because you'll, you know, then you don't even need this on this side. But that's not true, because if you do put that and only put six water molecules, people can mistakenly think that, that generally that the, um, the, that the carbon dioxide is the one that, don't, that gives off you know, the oxygen gas, and that is not the case. Okay, so recall, so we'll do a little review. Okay, so what happens? You have sunlight energy in the form of discrete packets of energy called photons hit photosystem 2. Okay, the photos, uh, or uh, a pigment molecule hitting a pigment molecule in photosystem two that jumps around from one pigment molecule to, to the next until it gets to the reaction center. Then you have the electron all excited, okay, with water molecule being split and the electron coming from the water molecule, as well as uh, hydrogen ions coming from the water molecule as well. Okay, oxygen gas also from the water mo molecule getting given off. Okay, so the water splitting photosystem is photosystem two. All right. Then what happens, so you know, within the membranes of the thylakoids in the, in, the, um, in the grana, then you have the electron transport chain happening where the electron is passed from one electron carrier to the next, electron carrier to the next, until the energy that is given off is used to make ATP right here. Next, you have another photon of energy hitting photosystem one. The same thing, you have the, uh, the energy bouncing from one you know, molecule to the next, you have the raising, you know, to excited energy state of the electron, and the electron is again passed down a series of electron carriers to form NADPH, which kind of ferries the electron and the hydrogens over to the Calvin cycle, okay? So you have ATP, 
and NADPH. KATP, K-generated, K3 electron transport, and NADPH also through uh, electron transport in photosystem one. Photosystem two, the water splitting photosystem. Photosystem one, the NADPH generating photosystem. Okay? Then what you'll have is the ATP, NADPH, the energy that they're carrying being used to fix carbon dioxide gas. Okay? Carbon dioxide gas okay, through, through all these turns of the Calvin cycle. Okay? Occurring in the stroma. Uh, the jelly-like liquid inside of the chloroplast, generating a three-carbon substance called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, okay? And eventually, you'll get glucose as the end product. Then the glucose is um, thereafter uh, transformed uh, to, or joined together to form either starch molecules or what it'll do, it'll actually form uh, sucrose or a double sugar molecule, okay? So that, in a nutshell, is photosynthesis. I know it can be kind of overwhelming. Just review your chapter, and don't forget to send me emails if you have any questions. Okay, but it is important to know this. Okay. All right. So here, we also have variations. Okay, of photosynthesis. So what we looked at just now with the Calvin cycle was what they call C3 fixation. Okay, in that where you have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or you have a three-carbon okay uh, substance that is used to make glucose. Now we also have variations on that theme. You have something called the C4 pathway, okay? We're not gonna go into real depth here, but just want you to know that they exist. And usually the C4 pathway tends to happen mostly in subtropical and tropical plants, especially subtropical and tropical uh, grasses, all right? Including very, very important corn, also known as maize, okay, zea maize, sugarcane, which is a saccharum species, and sorghum as well. These are tropical grasses, very important uh, food sources and energy sources for us human, okay? So there we saw little, some ears of corn, very beautiful ears of corn, okay? So what happens is that they call it the C4 pathway because C stands for carbon, and in this case, you have a four carbon compound being actually produced, okay, after the C4 pathway. And this usually happens under conditions of very high light intensity, like you'll have in the tropics or the subtropics, high temperatures, and also you might have low carbon dioxide availability as well, okay? So in the plant, you actually have this four carbon compound, which actually is stored in, uh, uh, in a row of cells that are surround the vascular bundle, okay? And so they happen in tropical cold grasses, such as sugarcane. So here you have sugarcane. I, I was wondering whether this is actually a sugarcane that is from Hawaii. It sort of looks like one, but I'm not certain, so I won't say that that's so. Of course, sugarcane, very important crop in Hawaiian agriculture fairly recently. And sugarcane was also known as coal. Okay, it was actually brought by the Polynesian people, people to Hawaii, okay, originally. So sugarcane and Hawaii go way back you know, maybe a couple of thousand years, all right? So generally, the C4 pathway, you have the uh, C4, you know, compound actually stored in a different place. So what you have is that in the plant, you actually stored spatially. You actually have a spatial distance between, you know, the production of the C4 sugar and the actual fixation, okay, making uh, glucose. Now, another variation is called CAM photosynthesis. Okay, and CAM, C-A-M, stands for crassulation acid metabolism. Okay, so in this case, you actually have, you know, certain kinds of plants such as cacti and succulents. So one of the things you notice, cacti, of course, are native to the Americas, yeah, the New World. And succulents such as jade plant, which is a crassula, that's why they named it crassulation acid metabolism because it was first observed in the members of the plant family, the crassulaceae. It also happens in um, bromeliad, such as pineapple, members of the pineapple family, the bromeliaceae. So we have the cactaceae, cacti, you have the bromeliaceae, and you also have the crassulas, okay, crassulaceae. Three different lineages of plants because of cacti are actually dicots, uh, bromeliads are monocots, amazingly. So they're very different, but this kind of um, way of photosynthesis actually happens in very different kind of plants. They're not that closely related at all, okay? 
So what happens is that you have a, another kind of four carbon compound. And what happens is that these plants, because they tend to live in very arid areas, high light areas in some cases, what they'll do is they, they won't actually do the carbon fixation, you know, that we saw in the Calvin cycle for C3 plants. And what happens, you know, spati uh, spatially in C4 plants, but what they'll do is they'll actually have a temporal difference between the light harvesting and the fixation of carbon. So what they'll do is that they'll fix carbon at night. Okay, so what you have is a temporal difference between the harvesting of light energy and the fixation of carbon because those are the two basic things that happen during photosynthesis. Okay, so next we're going to get into something called cellular respiration. Okay, I know that photosynthesis, that's quite a lot to do all at one time, but we're going to try to finish cellular respiration as well. Okay, first of all, okay, so in a human being, in our bodies, Okay, as well as other animals, what can happen is that we have a storage part product known as glycogen, where we um, actually have enough energy that our cells need, we'll store it in our liver, okay, as well as in our muscle cells, because of course, your muscle cells is one of the most energy needing parts of your body, right? So we'll generally store this glycogen in our muscle cells and also in our liver, all right? Th those are two of the main places where we store this glycogen. What this glycogen then does, we are, we'll, our, our bodies will actually break down this gly gly glycogen to form blood sugar, which we call glucose too, yeah? Fats can also be broken down into component glycerol and fatty acids and can enter this, this uh, uh, series here. So what happens during cellular respiration? First of all, you have something called glycolysis. And then, of course, it happens in plants as well. The glucose is broken down okay, into pyruvate, either pyruvate or pyruvic acid, depending on which textbook you're looking at. Okay, so this glucose, six carbon glucose, remember glucose has six carbons making it up, is broken into two, three carbon compounds known as pyruvate or pyruvic acid in a process known as glycolysis, okay? The py pyruvate then is um, adapted and it loses a carbon dioxide, so it's a two carbon compound, it joins with coenzyme A, and then it enters the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle is another cyclical pathway where the ending product that it ends up with here is actually used to regenerate the starting materials, okay? Then what happens is that during the Krebs cycle, you have the complete breakdown. So you have carbon dioxide being given off, all right? And then eventually you have the hydrogens and the, um, the electrons going to the electron transport system. So in cellular respiration, you also have electron transport going on. And it is, is during the electron transport chain, electron transport system, that the cell will actually harvest the most of what it needs. So what does this all mean? What, does, what do we get out of this? Think about it. Okay, we get the, the currency of energy in the cell. We get ATP, okay? So what cellular respiration does, it takes an energy source that's too large for the cell to use and breaks it down into smaller packets of, packets of energy called ATP, okay? That's what basically cellular respiration does. And this is aerobic cellular respiration. We're looking at cellular respiration that takes place in the presence of oxygen gas, okay? So remember, Okay, that generally cellular, uh, the photosynthesis happens in the green leaves of plants. Well, if we can go to the ELMO, we can kind of take a look at this again. Okay, so here we have the green parts of plants that also does cellular respiration as well as the parts you can't see, such as the stem, which has a horizontal underground stem called a rhizome in this fern, as well as the roots of the fern. Also, in all cells of the plant, cellular respiration is happening all the time. Also in this plant, also this moa, also known as um, Silotum, also known as, um, let's see, what else is it known as? <laughs> it's actually known as a non-flowering plant, okay? So in the stems of this plant here, you have not only photosynthesis going on, but you also have cellular respiration at the same time. Because recall in the plant cell, the plant cell, you know, the parts that are green will have chloroplasts, but they will also have mitochondria. Remember that mitochondria are the parts of the plants where most of cellular respiration happens, right? Right? So generally, cellular respiration happens all the time in all cells of a plant, as well as in our cells as well. Okay? So what is cellular respiration? Okay, recall we just said it is a breakdown of the glucose molecule. Okay? So this is important to know too. The overall balanced chemical reaction for cellular respiration or aerobic cellular respiration is, okay, 
glucose C6H12O6. Okay, so don't be scared of these chemical symbols. They're just symbols that stand for something. So C6H12O6 in this case only stands for glucose. Okay, six oxygen molecules because what happens is that what is aerobic cellular respiration? It is the breakdown of the sugar molecule by oxygen. Okay, it's actually breaking down the sugar molecule. Okay, and what you end up with Okay, after all the different chemical processes, after uh, glycolysis, after the Krebs cycle, after electron transport chain, you'll end up with six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and you'll have 36 ATP. Okay, anywhere between 30, 32 to 39, but usually we'll say 36 ATP. Okay, so you notice that it is a balanced chemical reaction. You have six carbons here, six carbons here. You have 12 hydrogens here, we'll have 12 hydrogens here, right? Six times two, 12 hydrogens. And you'll also have six oxygen here, plus six, uh, six no, this is 12. So what is that? That's uh, 18 oxygen. So we have, what is this? We have 12 and we have six. Yeah, so we have 18. So this is the overall balanced chemical reaction. So it looks simple, but it is quite complex, like just like photosynthesis, okay? Alrighty, so what happens during cellular respiration? Okay, you have those three parts that we talked about, glycolysis. Okay, you can remember glycolysis. Glyco means something sweet. Lysis means to split or to cut. Okay, so glycolysis is the splitting of the glucose molecule. Okay, a six carbon glucose to form two, three carbon pyruvates or pyruvic acids. Okay, then you have these pyruvate or pyruvic acid being adapted. It loses, both of them lose a carbon dioxide, and then it's ready. You have coenzyme A attached to it. Okay, then what the, this acetyl coenzyme A will then go into the Krebs cycle. Okay, during the Krebs cycle, you have the rest of the complete breakdown okay, of what's left of the glucose molecule with a regeneration of the starting molecule you started with, which I believe is called oxaloacetate. Then you have, you know, the hydrogen ions, uh, the uh, electrons going to car carried over by electron carriers to the electron transport system. And during the electron transport system, you have the slow controlled release of energy, okay, in order to form ATP, okay? So glycolysis, right? So generally, like we just said, it is a breakdown of uh, glucose to two, three carbon pyruvic acids or pyruvates, okay? We have NADH and ATP being produced during glycolysis as well, all right? And during the Krebs cycle, you have the, the, the extended and complete break breakdown of those three carbon compounds we talked about, either pyruvate or pyruvic acid, and you have the release of carbon dioxide gas. You also have the generation of ATP, NADH. Remember, this is sort of a, a related compound to NADPH, but just remember, you can think of P as photosynthesis. So NADH is a, a substance used in cellular respiration. NADPH, with the P standing for photosynthesis, is used in photosynthesis, yeah? You also have another electron carrier called FADH2. Okay, so ATP, NADH, FADH2 is produced, okay, and they ferry, uh, the NADH and FADH2 will ferry uh, electrons, okay, and, uh, over to the electron transport system. And during the electron transport system, this is the time when most of the ATP is produced, okay, most of the 36 ATP is produced during electron transport. And I'm going to try to explain the electron transport system to you a couple of times, okay, so if you don't quite catch it the first time, don't panic because later in the lecture we're going to explain it again. So this is showing the mitochondria, okay, the mitochondria. You have the outer membrane here, okay, you have the inner membrane here. And generally, electron transport chain happens in the inner membrane, okay, so what happens? Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, okay, the Krebs cycle happens within the mitochondrial matrix, you can see the Krebs cycle happens in here, and then you have the electron transport chain happen happening in the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's not shown here, but remember the inner mitochondrial membrane has all those infoldings, right, to increase the surface area, so they can actually have more electron transport systems happening, okay? So electron transport plus chemiosmosis. So what happens? You have the electron, trans the electron carriers, NADH here, also FADH2, okay, giving up their electrons, okay, giving up their electrons. And then these electrons are then transported, okay, from one electron carrier to the next, usually proteins embedded in the membrane, okay? Another thing that happens is that generally the 
hydrogen ions, okay, which are at lower concentration on this side of the membrane. They're actually pumped, okay, so the cell needs to invest energy to pump the protons to an area of higher concentration, which is the intermembrane space, the space between these two membranes here. So you have the protons pumped to an area of higher concentration. So yeah, this is active transport. It is not osmosis, even though they call it chemiosmosis. It's actually pumping okay, protons from this part of the membrane to the other side, where it's at higher concentration. And what happens is that here you have high concentration. Of course, if you have high concentration, a lot of free hydrogen ions, you have very low pH, okay? What then happens? You have a high concentration of these hydrogen ions on this side. They will diffuse okay, through these ATP synthases. Remember, ATP synthases actually make ATP. The hydrogen ions will diffuse through this, you know, passive transport, no energy expended to these ATP synthases. The ATP synthase will revolve, they'll actually rotate within the membrane. And every time it rotates, it will actually make one ATP molecule, okay, from ADP, I mean ADP plus a phosphate group. Okay, so you have ADP plus a phosphate group making ATP. So through this, you know, chemiosmosis and electron transport, Okay, the cell will actually make most of the ATP okay, through electron transport okay, and chemiosmosis. So don't worry, we'll, we, we'll also go over this one more time. Okay, so try not to worry about this too much. Okay? And as you find, as you uh, take notes, as you study, okay, as you look at your textbook, okay, remember that it's mainly the concept that you have to remember. Okay? Don't have to worry so much about too many details. Okay? You don't have to worry about the intermediate stages. Don't have to worry so much about what enzymes facilitate what chemical reactions. Just remember the concept. Okay? That's the most important thing. Okay, so cellular respiration. So where does it happen? We already said this. Okay? So glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. So all the enzymes, you know, they all happen in the, um, in the fluid inside of the cell. Okay? Then what happens? So what happens is the splitting of the glucose molecule, right? So phosphate groups are added then. Okay, so what is this process called? Do you guys remember what that's called? Okay. It's called phosphorylation, just a transfer of a phosphate group from one chemical to the next. Okay? So another thing too is that during glycolysis, the cell will actually need to invest two ATPs. Okay? It needs to invest two ATPs to make the reaction start. Okay? And there's a series of reactions that happen. Okay, so then you have these other steps that will involve the splitting of the six carbon compound, six carbon glucose, eventually into two, three carbon compounds. Okay, so another thing too is you also have NADH made from NAD plus plus a hydrogen ion. Okay, what you'll have is that at, at the end, okay, at the end of glycolysis, you'll end up with two molecules of pyruvate, right, two, three carbon pyruvate plus four ATPs. Okay, so what happens? The cell has invested two ATPs, right? So what you have after glycolysis is you just have a net of two ATPs after glycolysis because two was invested, they get four ATPs out of glycolysis, so you end up with a net two ATPs. You know, you can think of your paycheck, and you get paid, what, maybe $500 or something, and then they'll take $150 out, right? So what you'll net is $350, yes, so generally what you net is what you end up with, yes? So the cell will net two ATPs, right? And you also net two NADHs, which carry electron plus hydrogen ions as well, okay? So you have net two ATPs. Okay, another thing that happens, here you go, animation, this is great. So you start off with a six carbon sugar, right, glucose. After several steps, okay, you end up with two three carbon molecules, two three carbon sugars, okay, three carbon molecules. And then that's actually can interconvert between one form and another. Don't worry about the names for this so much, okay, but still, you have a splitting into two three carbon uh, sugars, goes through more, more and more different kinds of chemical reactions, and then what you'll end up with, it would be pyruvate or pyruvic acid, okay? Then what happens is that first the Krebs cycle happens, but first, okay, which happens in the mitochondrial matrix, in the inner part of the mitochondria, in, inside, interior to the second membrane inside. So what happens is that the pyruvate first has to go through some changes before it enters the Krebs cycle, right? 
So first of all, it lo loses the CO2. So what do you have then? What, what you'll have is an acetate at a uh, molecule because it loses one carbon dioxide. Okay, so what you end up with is two, two carbon things, two, two carbons. So what happens is this two, two carbon compound, this acetate will join to something called coenzyme A, usually abbre abbreviated CO capital A. Okay, so what that you end up with is something called acetyl coenzyme A. I don't really know why that, why that happens because pretty much the first thing that happens is it loses the coenzyme A, the COA. But anyway, so what then happens is that the NADH is generated too. Okay, so this acetyl coenzyme A will con then combine with a four carbon compound. So what, what do you end up with? You'll end up with a six carbon compound. Okay, it's kind of interesting. Okay, so then through the Krebs cycle, you have more decarboxylation. So that's just a fancy word for saying that you will actually end up with, you know, carbon dioxide being given off. So here in the Krebs cycle, you'll have the breakdown, the complete breakdown of what of the three carbon compound that you started with in the Krebs cycle. Okay, NADH made, FADH2 made, and so these two compounds will actually carry electrons, okay, to into the electron transport system. Okay, ATP is formed too, right? So this four carbon compound that we started with at the beginning of the Krebs cycle will be regenerated then too, okay? So you prepare yourself. So first of all, you have the for formation of acetyl coenzyme A. Here you had the giving off of a carbon dioxide and then what you'll have is um, you have coenzyme A, okay, joining to the acetate. So what you end up with is acetylcholine. Isn't this great? Yeah, look at that. And another thing, so what you'll have is you'll have this acetylcholine joining to something called oxaloacetate. Okay, these two join together to form citrate. It goes through several more changes here, just like we saw before in photosynthesis. Each of these arrows uh, means some kind of a change, some kind of a chemical reaction. So here it's greatly simplified, but it's good to see that you do have like a, quite a few intermediates, and carbon dioxide is given off as well until you have a four carbon compound, four malate, and that's made into oxaloacetate. So this is a four carbon compound. So why, I don't know why the cell does this, but you have a two carbon acetyl coenzyme A joining onto a four carbon oxaloacetate. So what you start off with is another six carbon compound, which is, you know, kind of confusing, but this is the way the cell does it. I know I've asked the physiologist, you know, uh, a professor who taught physiology, and you know, I said, why would the cell do that? And then he just said, he doesn't know. Okay, so I don't know either. <laughs> but that's what happens. So you start off with a six carbon, five carbon, get, end up with four carbon, and you have the regeneration of the starting molecule. Okay, ready to go again. Another turn in the cycle. So just know that the Krebs cycle is like the complete breakdown, okay, of the three carbon compound you started with, okay? And then what happens in the Krebs cycle, okay? Anyway, so next thing we're going to talk about is the electron transport system. So this is located, um, many of them, on the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? So the electron transport system, okay? What happens is that the electrons, remember the electrons, are gotten, or it's passed from NADH, okay, and FADH2, those are the two electron carriers that will actually carry electrons, okay, from the Krebs cycle to, and also, you know, NADH is also generated during glycolysis, and these electrons are then passed into the electron transport chain. What happens is that these electrons fall, fall to oxygen, because do you remember way back when we were talking about chemical formations? Remember that oxygen is the most, uh, just about the most electronegative of all the different elements. It has a tendency, just like in the water molecule, to pull electrons to itself. So what happens is that pretty much the electrons get into the electron transport chain. They actually pass from one electron acceptor to the next in a series of redox reactions. Remember redox reactions? That's when one, you know, LEO, loss of electrons, is oxidation. They call it oxidation because they're facilitated by oxygen, okay? Reduction is when you have a gain of electrons. You have a gain, then loss. You have reduction, then oxidation. Reduction, then oxidation from one electron carrier to the next. What then happens is that you'll have a generation of water molecule, okay? So what happens is that pretty much the sugar is broken down by oxygen gas and produces carbon dioxide, okay, which we saw in the Krebs cycle, right? The breakdown of uh, of, of the sugar molecule and then generating water, all right? Isn't that interesting? Okay, 
So in chemiosmosis, most of the ATPs then are synthesized during chemiosmosis because you remember in glycolysis you only had a net two ATP generated and in uh, the Krebs cycle, okay, also very little, okay. So during chemiosmosis you have these protons pumped into the intermembrane space or the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the mitochondria, right? And what happens is that these hydrogen ions will diffuse back via the ATP synthesis back into the matrix or the innermost part of the mitochondria. And what that does is that that will generate the most ATP, a whole bunch of them, you know, like about 32 or something, right? A whole lot of the 36 that we end up with. Okay, so what happens during electron transport? You have the NADH, okay, giving up a hydrogen ion as well as passing on the electron okay, to these electron acceptors. So what happens is that it will actually uh, go from one electron acceptor to the next until it falls to water, okay, or to oxygen to make water. Okay, so the hydrogen ion will fall, okay, to make water plus the electron. What happens then too, you have the protons pumped, okay, through active transport, okay, by fuel by the ATP generated, okay. So the protons are pumped to the intermembrane space and then they diffuse back to the ATP synthase. And each time a hydrogen ion it passes back into the matrix of the mitochondrion, this ATP, ATP synthase will turn okay, in the membrane. Every time it turns, it generates ATP okay, from ADP plus a phosphate group. It actually makes ATP. The same thing happens with the FADH2. It will actually pass on the electron Okay, and liberate these two uh, hydrogen ions, what happens is that the hydrogen ions are pumped okay, by these uh, proteins in the, in the membrane. Because you remember, the membrane is made up of the phospholipids, as depicted here, as well as the proteins embedded within the phospholipids. Okay? So here you also have the protons pumped from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. So, so there's a tension here. So on this side of the membrane, you have very low pH. It's very acid because you have a lot of free hydrogen ions, right? Remember, pH stands for potential hydrogen ion concentration. The lower the pH is, the more acid it is, right? So this is pretty acid. You have a lot of hydrogen ions. Then the hydrogen ions will diffuse through the ATP synthase to the other side, making ATP, okay, through chemiosmosis. Isn't that interesting in that, okay? I know it's kind of a lot, yeah, to, to kind of uh, sort of get all at one time. I know it is, but it is very interesting, you know. Oftentimes people um, find the, the um, they often find the physiology part among the most challenging uh, in the semester, and we also tend to have a, a lot of um, good things coming from that too. Just like anything else, the more challenged you are, the harder you work for something, the more you get out of it. So if it, uh, when you can understand this, these physiological processes, you know you will have really understood a lot and you will have learned a lot too. Okay, so cellular respiration. Okay, uh, we're gonna do a little accounting for cellular respiration. Okay, for generally, for each glucose molecule that we start with, okay, we end up with about approximately 36 ATPs. <clears throat> Okay, so what happens is that is these 36 ATPs are about 39% of the energy in the glucose molecule, okay? That actually is pretty efficient, okay? But, so about 61% of the energy that is held in the glucose molecule, remember held in chemical bonds, right? So about 61% is actually lost, okay, from the system. It's usually dissipated mostly as heat, okay? So for um, cellular respiration or aerobic cellular respiration, okay, we, we get almost a 40% efficiency, okay? That's actually quite high, okay? It's very efficient because remember when we talked about the car analogy last time? If we use an automobile analogy, remember that we did have that little drawing, okay, of the car, okay? Let's kind of maybe, um, kind of shift over to the Elmo a little bit, and we call, we'll draw that little car for you again. Okay, so we have a little car, right? A little Volkswagen bug here, okay, and here. And this car, which is, you know, it's actually not very efficient, but for a human-made, a man-made sort of um, system, it's pretty efficient. Remember, about 75% 
about 75 cents of every dollar's worth of gasoline you put into your car, which could be, um, which could be pretty much, okay, 75%, okay, about 75% goes up literally in smoke, okay, so 75 cents per dollar, okay, is actually not utilized by the car. To actually make your car go forward, okay, is about 25%. And for a, a man-made system, a human-made system, that is very efficient, okay? So you can see that when you do this accounting in cellular respiration, right, that cellular respiration is pretty efficient, okay? When we, get, uh, when we talk about energetics too, generally when you eat a food, like in the plant material, okay, so the plant material that has all this stuff, whether you're eating lettuce, a salad, radishes, and such like that, generally maybe about 10% of the energy that's in the food you eat, whether it's meat or whether it's vegetables, okay, only about 10% is actually used useful energy for you in your body. That's kind of amazing. So in terms of uh, the cell, you know, a 39% efficiency rate is pretty good. It's, it's pretty efficient, okay? Next, we're going to talk about a little something else. We're going to talk about a little bit different kind of respiration because what we've been looking at has been aerobic respiration, a respiration that takes place in the presence of oxygen. Because you remember, in the electron transport system, generally the electrons will fall to oxygen because oxygen has a tendency to pull electrons toward themselves. Okay, So uh, the presence of oxygen is a good thing in cellular respiration, but it can also be a bad thing. Because what happens to metal when it is exposed to oxygen? It rusts, right? You have actually the degradation of uh, metal. And what happens to our bodies? Our bodies as well as plant bodies, most people think that aging and eventual cell death is due to oxidation, which is the action of oxygen and some of its other products on our bodies as well as on the plant body. So it's a funny thing because, you know, some people call say that oxygen is actually, was actually maybe the first air pollution, the first pollution that we had in our atmosphere because the presence of oxygen and some of its intermediates is actually responsible for the aging of cells, you know, what we call aging, and also maybe eventual cell death as well, okay? So aerobic respiration is actually the most efficient type, okay? So aerobic respiration needs oxygen, okay, in order for it to happen. It's also the most efficient form of respiration. But we also have another kind of respiration known as anaerobic respiration. This is respiration that takes place without oxygen, Okay, without the use of oxygen. Another word for this kind of respiration is called fermentation. Okay? Among organisms that this is very common in, yeasts, okay, yeasts are single-celled fungi, okay, so they happen in yeasts or fungi and bacteria. So among some bacteria and some yeasts, this is the main way that they do their uh, metabolism, how they break down you know, fuel molecules to, to make it available to these organisms. Yeah. So um, let's see. So let's see. So we have muscle tissue as well. Let's see. Let's back up. I'm sorry. I kind of jumped the gun here. So we have these yeasts, okay, responsible for some of the uh, molds and such that are responsible for blue cheeses and things like that. So fermentation produces cheeses, and also in uh, we, we also also use yeast in terms of brewing, right? Brewing beer, wine making. Okay, so what fermentation is, you can have two different kinds of fermentation. You can have alcoholic fermentation, okay, which, you know, produces alcohol or ethanol. You also have uh, lactic acid fermentation that is used to uh, make cheeses and other things like that. So they happen in these more so-called so simpler organisms such as yeast and bacteria, and they happen in animals as well, like in our muscle tissue. So what happens? So here we have this very fit young fellow kind of doing water training. He's running in the water, which of course will provide for resistance against his muscles. So it is actually harder to exercise in water. And, and I think uh, some football players and other people who train pretty hard, they also do sand training. I knew this young fellow, I think we were students together, and he, and he was an ex-high uh, ex school football player, and he said sand training, that his coach would actually make them do sand training until they uh, vomited up their breakfast, which is kind of, you know, not so bad, I mean, not so good, right? Okay, so uh, sand training is very hard training because you're actually moving your muscles against the resistance in sand. This fellow here is actually using the resistance in water to do the same thing, to actually provide for more resistance, making the muscle work harder. 
as you can see, okay, in you have these fascicles, okay, and you have the uh, um, muscle cells in here. And when you actually get to the what it co comes to the nitty gritty, we tend to store glycogen. Remember when we talked about that at the beginning of the part on respiration? We actually have glycogen stored in our muscles because we need to have glycogen handy to be broken down to glucose, so that so your muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria in them. Okay, because what we need is we need to take okay, the uh, uh, glucose and break it down into ATP because that is an energy form that the cell recognizes and we have a lot of that in our muscle tissue. What can happen is that if you're, if, if you're not as fit as this young man here, if you're you know, sort of you know, not as fit just like me and not as fit as I used to be before, what can happen is that your muscles will actually switch from aerobic respiration, which can harvest 36 ATP, for every glucose molecule, the glucose molecule coming, coming from the breakdown of glycogen stored in muscle tissue, okay? What can happen is that your body will switch to an, an anaerobic pathway, okay? Or you're actually gonna be using a lac lactic acid fermentation. It will actually break it down so you only harvest about two ATP, okay, in anaerobic respiration, whether it's alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. Okay, so what that means is that you can't get as much energy. This is one of the reasons why when you've been exercising really hard, especially when you have not after a while, what can happen is you get this uh, burn in your muscles. Okay, so they're thinking that some of the burn might come from micro, micro tears in your muscle that come from working out strong. It also happens when you have lactic acid buildup in your muscle. You get the cramping, yeah, and the burn from, from uh, aerobic exercise. So we humans, animals, we too can do, can switch to an anaerobic pathway when we need to. One of the things that happens, if you're training really hard and you're gasping for breath and then like if you uh, walk up 10 flights of stairs when you're not used to it, okay, or even run up it or something like that, you're breathing hard and that's because your cells need the energy, okay? All right, so in terms of uh, summarizing our lecture today, I know that was a lot that we covered, okay, but still, yeah, it can be good, yes, because you can then understand. So first of all, we covered pigments in plants, and what do they do? They harvest light, okay. We also talked about the two parts of photosynthesis, including the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, right, where the plant will actually take sunlight energy and convert it to chemical energy, okay. We talked about the light reactions happening in the grana. Remember what the grana are? These are stacks of thylakoid membranes, okay, with all these uh, light harvesting reaction centers all embedded in the membrane in the grana. We talked about the Calvin cycle that happens in the jelly-like fluid, this jelly-like matrix inside of the chloroplast called the stroma, right? And we also talked about the formula, the overall balanced chemical reaction for photosynthesis. Six carbon dioxides plus 12 water molecules plus sunlight, which you end up with glucose, okay, six, C6, H12O6, plus six molecules of oxygen gas, O2, plus six molecules of water, okay, six H2O. Okay, we also talked a little bit about uh, uh, C4 photosynthesis, so-called C4 photosynthesis, and CAM photosynthesis. Yes. Now we also, you know, not to overwhelm you, but you know, since these are physiological processes and we were able to fit them in this lecture, okay, so we talked about cellular respiration. So that is a breakdown of glucose to make ATP, all right? So the, the chemical formula for, he, for this is you have, um, you have uh, C6H12O6 glucose plus six molecules of oxygen gas. And what you end up with after uh, uh, let's see, the parts of, photos, uh, of cellular respiration, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, electron transport, you end up with six molecules of carbon dioxide gas, six molecules of water, and 36 ATP. So you can see that the two formulae for photosynthesis and respiration are almost inverses of each other, yes? So glycolysis, of course, happens in the cytoplasm. You have the Krebs cycle happening within the inner matrix of the mitochondrion as well. And then thirdly, you have the electron transport system, which is located on the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Anyway, so hopefully that wasn't too bad. That wasn't too hard. And like I said, please email me with any questions if you have any. All right. And um, I can, I'll be happy to go over it, over it with you again, too. If you want to make an appointment with me, want to see me in my office hours, I'll be very happy to go over it again. Okay. So that's all we have time for today, and that's all we have for you today, and we'll see you next time, okay? So bye-bye, and see you then.